was wrong about you. They're coming for you. I'm not the one that needs to watch their back. This doesn't have to end in a fight, Tony. You just started a war. Stay down. Final warning. I could do this all day. All right, I've run out of patience. On to Ruth! Hey, everyone. All right, well, good morning, Metro. And good morning to those in the nursery and to our online community. Uh, welcome to our God on Film summer series. And, uh, you know, I took a class in seminary called uh, Real Theology. And so I kind of learned in seminary that every movie has some kind of the theological meaning that you can extract from it. And so that's kind of what the hope is for the next several weeks, that we're going to take out some of these movies that are considered to be this summer's biggest blockbuster movies, and we're going to extract some theological themes to it. We'll do it to the best of our ability. So just by show of hands, how many of you in this room actually saw the movie Captain America Civil War? Let me see your hands. Okay. Oh, wow. It's like maybe 30%. First service is more than half. Um, but uh, I thought it was a pretty good movie. And, but how many of you are kind of like superheroed out? Like you're just tired of these movies. There's like four or five of them come out every season of life. And so I think like I'm kind of in that boat. But then the setup team and I, we went to go watch uh, X-Men on Friday, and we actually enjoyed the movie. I know a lot of people don't like it, and they get, it got terrible reviews, but we thought it was a pretty good movie. And so, um, but this movie, Captain America, uh, really what we find is that Captain uh, America, or Captain Rogers, is uh, confronted with two major choices, heroic choices, we call them. What are heroic choices? There are choices that you and I make that are literally epic. Uh, they have a, 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 an opportunity to steer our life in the right direction, or really cause serious consequences for us to experience in our life. Those are the epic decisions, like about maybe who you should marry. That's epic, isn't it? That's an epic decision. Perhaps maybe thinking about a vocation you need to pursue that goes, diff that goes kind of different from the kind of life that you're living now or the job that you have now. Or maybe a vocation in which you feel like maybe will get your parents upset that if you decide to go that way. But those are epic decisions. Decisions of you committing your life to Jesus Christ, that's an epic decision. A, a decision of maybe make, uh, getting a divorce or not, that is an epic decision. A, a decision to potentially say, you know what, I'm going to stay sexually pure till I get married. That, those are epic decisions. There are so many different types of decisions that we come through. And so Captain Rogers had two major decisions he had to make that were of heroic proportions. The first one was, does he sign the Hero Registration Act? Now, what that basically is is that about over 100 countries got together, and they concluded that the Avengers need some accountability that they have to have greater authority than the Avengers, because if they don't, then innocent lives will be taken, and countries will be literally destroyed as a result of it. And so they concluded that they needed to sign this. Well, uh, Iron Man was all for it, and a couple of other the Avengers were really for signing this. But Captain Rogers, Captain America, was struggling. He struggled tremendously about signing it. And so the, the, the choice was, does he sign this Hero Registration Act, or does he... Not, and if he doesn't, there are some severe consequences to it if he does not sign it. The other uh, challenge or choice that he had to make was does he save his lost friend, Bucky Barnes? Bucky was brainwashed by an organization called Hydra, and Hydra's goal was to destroy the world. They were a terrorist group, and he was brainwashed by them, and so he, they would often use him to do different types of terrorist type activities. And in this movie, um, Bucky was linked to blowing up uh, the, the city of Vienna and it killed world leaders and innocent lives. And so as a result of it, the Avengers, uh, the, the government were after, nations were after Bucky. And Captain America had to make a choice. Do I save him and try to restore my relationship with him or do I actually help the authorities catch my long lost friend? Major major decisions. 
one of the most important things that you will ever do in your life on a daily basis are actually linked to the choices and the decisions that you're making. What kind of choices and decisions are you making today? Is it bringing you life or is it actually killing you? A lot of times when we make poor decisions, I find that many of us, we kind of live our life in the past. Do you know what that's like? Kind of always thinking about what could have been, should have, would have, could have, if things would have changed. And sometimes because of some of the traumatic experiences of our past, we can't seem to get out of it. And we always think and lament about some of the things that could have been or should have changed or should have happened in my life as a result of it. And many of us, we live in the past, don't we? And listen, it's important for us to learn from our past, but to live in our past is toxic and is not why you were put on this earth for. And so today, what I'd like to do for us is that I'd like for us to unpack a passage of scripture and talk about this movie and try to figure out how can we make heroic choices in our life? Because the only thing that's the most important thing for you to focus on is the moment that is right before you right now and the choices that you have to make today in the present today. Nothing in your past. And we want to look at through this passage in Genesis chapter 22 through the story of Abraham. How do we begin to make heroic choices that actually allow us to experience God in a deeper, deeper way? That's what I'd like to talk to you about today. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. And we're going to look at the first 18 chapters, uh, 18 verses, 18 chapters, 18 verses. Some of you would actually like that. And then some of you, it would be difficult. All right, Genesis chapter 22. Verse 1, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, now you got to know that Abraham pulled an all-nighter here. He didn't go to sleep. He loved his son, Isaac. It says in verse 3, early the next morning, Abram got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound, his son, he, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as a sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is the word of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. So God, we come to you with this rich text. We ask that you would speak to us. Teach us how we can make better choices in our life, heroic choices of macro proportions so, God, that we can live our life side by side with you. I pray for those in this room, God, who are horrible at making the right choice. I pray for those in this room that stumble almost on a daily basis because they make the choices that don't lead to you. I pray that you'd really speak to them, empower, convict, encourage. And I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts in this room, I pray, God, that it will be pleasing unto you. And all of God's people said... Amen. All right, so Abraham is confronted here with two 
with a, with a major decision he had to make, all right? And the decision is, does he offer his son as a sacrifice? Basically, let me just translate it to you. Does he kill his son at the altar, or does he use human logic and starts to reason with God and talks God out of it, or talks himself out of it? How many of you have ever done that? You use human logic, and you try to talk God out of something that maybe you feel like he's leading you or encouraging you to do. Abraham had every right to do this. He really did. Because in chapter 15 of Genesis, what happens there? God promises Abraham and says, through you, through your offsprings, it will be so numerous, it will be as much as the star, more than the stars in the sky. And he promises him that, right? We talked about last week about the promises of God, that that's what faith is, is living into it. And here is Isaac, he's living into that promise. And so he could have told God and said, God, you're going against your promises. And he could have tried to reason with him. But what does Abraham do here? He doesn't do that, and yet he submits himself and he decides to offer his son as a sacrifice. What we learn about heroic choices that often that we have to make, we learn two things about it. The first thing we learn about heroic choices is that it's painful. Heroic choices are always painful. They're not easy. They often will come from a deep place of pain like it did for Abraham. Abraham didn't sleep the night before. Abraham didn't, and when he woke up and he took his son, I mean, he was in dire, dire pain, struggling with the reality that he had to give up his son and take his life because God had ordered him to. It was a painful, painful act. Captain America had to make a choice, a heroic choice. And for him, even though Iron Man and some of the other Avengers wanted to sign the Hero Registration Act, Captain America decided not to. He said that he didn't want the choice. He didn't want the government to take away his freedom to choose. He felt that, honestly, the world was in a more dangerous place if the Avengers had that kind of authority over them. So he did not sign it, and that, that, that created a rift between he and, Cap and Iron Man. And we see that sort of progress within the movie. He also made the choice to save his friend Bucky, even though Bucky never asked for it. And as he saved his friend Bucky Barnes, what ends up happening then is now he now is wanted and now he now is liable for all the crimes that Bucky has committed. And so what we learn in this passage is that when God calls you to make a heroic choice, it's often quite painful. It's not easy. It's not easy. I still remember the day when I got married, a few months into it, my wife and I, we finally decided after a long ordeal of just praying and, and trying to figure out this is where God was leading us to go into ministry, um, we decided to, to, to take that calling. And one of the things is that I really felt God was calling us to move to California for, us, for me to do my graduate studies out in L.A., and uh, I knew that would be very difficult. And when my wife agreed that she would do this, she said, only on one condition, you got to tell my father. And I knew I had to, but I didn't want to. Because right, my father, he's like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, in law, but he's scary to me, right? Because my wife's family, I call them the mafia. They stay together. You don't take the family and go tra move to another, another side of the country. Like, there would be severe consequences if he decided to do that. So I saw him as the godfather. And so I knew I had to tell him that uh, I'm going to take his daughter and quit my job, a nice job working at NBC, and move over and be a pastor. And he's not a Christian. So I knew he wouldn't get this. So I told my wife, okay, I'll tell him eventually. So we set a date when this was going to happen. I prayed about it. I had people, my friends, pray for, it, pray for me. The day that we were going to go down to Edison, New Jersey, and to have dinner with the family and to tell them, I mean, I was nervous that entire day. It was painful. Just being at work was painful. Like, I wish I'd taken a day off, right? Because I couldn't stop thinking about it. I just thought he's going to react so negatively to it. He's going to sort of take a chair, maybe throw it at me. I was thinking of the worst things of what would happen to me. And we go there, and it was just such an amazing evening. I mean, he was having so much fun. We enjoyed a meal together. He was really happy and cheery. And the happier he was, I mean, my heart sunk because I knew I was going to break his heart. I knew and it was just painful. I knew I was going to cause him pain. And so we're, we get to dessert time, we go into the living room, we're eating like our watermelon and our peaches and apples and stuff, and that's usually the Korean choice of dessert. And so we're eating that stuff, and then my wife just keeps looking at me, and she just says, hurry up. I said, I know, okay, relax. And I finally tell him. And the big smile on his face when I called him, you know, dad, he said, yes. And when I told him, the look on his face after I told him broke my heart. It was painful. Heroic choices are often extremely painful. 
especially if God's leading you to do something. Because usually when God calls you to do something that's of God's size proportion, it's painful. It's not easy. But you know what the second thing you learn about heroic choices when you're able to make it? Heroic choices equals holy choices. Same thing. Holy choices or heroic choices. You know the second thing I learned after I told that to my father-in-law is that heroic choices often open the doors for us to encounter God. It's painful, yes. It was so painful for me to share with him that I'm going to take his daughter now, go into ministry, even though he didn't believe in God, and we're going to move to Los Angeles. Two years ago, he gave his daughter's, oldest daughter's hand to marriage to a man who lived up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So they already lost the daughter up there. And now his second daughter was now going there, going to California. And so, but what I experienced was I encountered God through that interaction because though he was sad and he showed it, he actually treated me like an adult, and I didn't have a model for that because I grew up in such a dysfunctional family. That's why I was anticipating the worst. When he respected me and said, listen, you're a man. You can make your own decision. But my experience and my advice, because I've lived longer than you, is that I would not go into ministry because it will be a hard life for my daughter and for you. And, and he said, I really would reconsider that. And then that was option A. Option B he gave me. He said, well, then if you decide to go, would you please stay local? Don't take my daughter to Los Angeles. All right? And I said, I will pray about it. I really will, and I'll think about it. I respect him so much for that, that moment and how he treated me. But it was an opportunity for me to encounter God. You see, our heroic choices, Metro, though they are painful that God will call you and I to make, they are often times, encounters for us to experience God in a beautiful way. And we see that with Abraham here. Because as Abraham made the heroic choice of sacrificing his son, what happens? God provides the ram. He sees the providentialness of God as he makes the heroic choice or the holy choice to listen and to do what God has called him to do. Captain America made a very difficult decision to save his friend Bucky, even though everything in him, because he's a righteous man, was going against the possibility of saving him because of what would happen if he got caught. Right? He risked his life to save him. And what happened through that? He experienced a restored relationship with Bucky. Because if you watched Captain America, I think the last movie, Bucky tried to kill him. So they had a broken relationship and it was being restored. When you and I make heroic choices, it opens the door for us to encounter God. When I, when I, when I, so after that moment, everything was easy. I went into my job. I gave him, you know, my 30-day notice. I said, hey, I'm quitting. And, uh, and, you know, people at work were kind of like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to go into ministry? And all they said was, hey, please put in a good word for me with a guy upstairs. <laughs> all of a sudden, like, they feel like I had this special access to God that they didn't have. And I just said, sure, no problem. I'll do that for you. When I went to California, I started talking to some of these folks that I started to meet, and even we wanted to get to know each other, be friends. I told them about sort of our, my story and that, you know, I'm a second career pastor, that I, before that I worked in television and, and stuff like that. And so all of them, without fail, they all said to me, wow, was it like a major sacrifice for you to quit your job and to pursue ministry? And I looked at all of them, and I said to them, I said, no. It would have been a major sacrifice if I stayed. I don't want to brag. I really don't. But I think I am one of the few Christians in the world today where I actually know why God created me for. And once I learned why God put me here on earth for, I mean, it just it was a decision I had to make. And the encounters of God since then was an amazing thing. And you know, my hope and my prayer for you as I prayed for you this week was that you would start to discover why God put you on this earth for. That there's a reason why you're here. And once you learn that, and though it may be painful potentially to make a choice to go in that direction, it's a sacrifice if you don't. And the joys and the encounter of God that I experienced ever since I made that decision to quit my job and to go into this field in which I feel God has called me to has been nothing less of just multitudes upon multitudes of me seeing the face of God, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I hope and I pray that for you. But your decisions that you make are so critical because it will either open those doors for you to experience God or not. 
All right? So with that said, how do we make these heroic choices? How can you and I begin to make these heroic choices? According to this passage, there are three things. The first thing is this. Heroic choices are made when we embrace the testing of God. So this is not, not about something you do. This is about you embracing a truth about God's deity, that God is a God who will test you. He will test me. All right? In the movie Captain America, he was being tested beyond his wits when he didn't sign the act. There was a civil war that broke out between him and the Avengers. And so it was like half the Avengers were on his side and the other half were on Iron Man's side. And it was an epic, epic civil war. At the end of the movie, he and Iron Man had a showdown and they fought almost to their death. That was a sacrifice he had to make. It was a test that he had to pass. The same thing with Bucky as he saved his life. Will he do this? Will he do this and save the life of his long lost friend in hopes of a restored relationship? These are often tests. When you look at Abraham, Abraham was being tested by God, right? Abraham was truly being tested by God. Why? Why? Why did God test Abraham? Well, why does God test you and why does God test me? If I ask you a question, why does God provide for you? Why did God send his son Jesus Christ to come and die for you on the cross? How would you answer that? Because God loves me. Absolutely, that is the right question. God provides for you. He provided the greatest need of your life, which is the son Jesus Christ, to come and die for you on the cross and resurrect from the dead. As a result, that shows God's love, amen? amen. So then why does God test us? The same reason, because he loves you. Because this passage teaches us that in order for you to experience the providentialness of God's love, you have to first pass the test. The ram didn't come to Abraham until he passed the test. The most complacent religion is a religion where we want God to provide, but we won't embrace the notion that he tests us. God does test us. And sometimes God will be so providential and answer a prayer request that you've prayed for. Some of you have prayed long and hard for certain prayers in your life. And God won't answer it. And it's miraculous. But here's the deal. What we learned in this passage. Sometimes he's going to say, I want it back. And the challenge is, will you give it back to him? Will you? Because God wants to know, is the gift bigger than the giver in your life? He wants to know that. Sometimes he'll, ask, he'll give you what you ask for, but in this passage it says that he'll give it back. You see, why does God test? I mean, there's scholars debate about this passage so much. There's some scholars that actually say that God tests Abraham because he doesn't know, that God doesn't know. And look, we, I preached this to our staff on Friday. We had almost a 90-minute debate theologically about this passage of why God tests. It was so rich. I loved it. All right? And it was basically me and David Hosang going at it. All right? <laughs> That's basically what it was. And of course, he won. But why? There's a difference between knowledge of cognition versus knowledge of experience. Let me explain that for you. Knowledge of cognition or cognitive knowledge simply states that God knows everything, and he does. He knows the past. He knows your present. He knows your future. God knew 100% without a shadow of a doubt that Abraham was going to do this. He did know it but he wanted to experience it in real time. That's the experiential knowledge that God is looking for. It's the same thing when there's ample evidence throughout the Bible where God desires for you and I to act out our faith and worship regardless of the fact that God may know our hearts. That's why he wants you to pray all the time. You may pray for certain things and God may already be setting it in motion, but he still wants you, he wants you to pray because he wants to experience you and experience the reality of what you're praying for in real time with you. It's an important thing. That's why you should come to worship and worship God. God may know your heart, but there's sort of a real-time experience that God longs for that makes it so real and rich when you experience it that way. Your kids know that they love you. I think they know with their minds. Your wife and husband know that they love you. Your parents should know that they love you. But there's something to be said about cognitive knowledge that kind of makes it dry, doesn't it? The experiential knowledge of experiencing that love in real time is so much richer, isn't it, Metro? And that's why God also longs for the experiential of it. He longs to experience your faithfulness and my faithfulness in real time. That's why God tests as well. To put that better in play is that uh, 
This week, uh, Thursday night at the dinner table, my daughter, Christina, she's in ninth grade now, and she's studying for her finals. They're coming up. And uh, she needs ample time to study for them. And so I just said, what's going on in school these days? Uh, what are you going to do tomorrow at school on Friday? You got anything going on? She's like, no, it's just kind of like the end of the year now. So we just kind of clown around. There's not much we do. I said, oh. I said, well, you know, why don't you just take the day off and stay home tomorrow? And she looked at me like, what? <laughs> my wife looked at me like, are you crazy? I said, no, I think because you need time to study and you got to work on your study notes. I said, take the day off, stay home, and work on your history exam because you got a ton of notes you got to write up for it, study notes. And I said, Christina, I believe and I know that you're going to study and you're going to study hard. I hope you will do that and that you won't slack off. And because nobody was there, it was just her and the dog. And that she could have easily just watched TV, watch YouTube on her phone. I said, I do know that you're going to make the right decision. She goes, of course I am. I get home that night and I said, hey, um, how's your day? And she goes, oh, my brain is fried. I just studied all day. It's just, it's painful. She goes, can I take a break? I said, absolutely. But there was this joy of experiencing what she just did that made it so rich for me to appreciate her more and say, you're such a hard worker. You see, there's a cognitive knowledge that I knew she would do that, but there's this experiential knowledge that really makes it special, that really makes it special. And that's kind of what, it hap what happens here with God, with Abraham. My professor in seminary, Dr. Bobby Clinton, a great professor on leadership, he says that every day God is going to give you a pop quiz. Every day. And the challenge is, will you pass it or not? A pop quiz like if somebody cuts you off and gives you the middle finger, how are you going to respond? It's a pop quiz. A pop quiz like you go to Costco's and the line is just exceptionally long and you're just like, what's going on with this line? And the cashier is just taking forever. They're talking all day to the customers. You're like, stop talking and work. <laughs> That's a pop quiz. A pop quiz, maybe you've heard somebody gossiping about you. How are you going to respond? He says, if you fail it, you can't move and progress forward in your life. But if you pass the pop daily pop quiz that God gives to you, then he'll open doors and greater responsibilities will come your way. And the quizzes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get to see the glory of your God. I failed the pop quiz yesterday miserably. <laughs> I, I don't know what was wrong with me. But I think for me, it was like that time of the month for me. And guys get it too. Really, we do. And I just, my wife, I was mean to her. Probably five, six instances throughout the day. And there was no reason for me to be that mean to her, but I just was. I was just, I was yelling at her at times. Uh, you know, I was, I got back from a workout in the morning and I had to get my daughter ready for tennis practice. And so she's trying to talk to me and I'm just, I'm just busy. And she kept saying, Peter, Peter, Peter. And then I just said, what? <laughs> and she looked at me like, what's wrong with you? And that happened about five times yesterday. And at night she said, you better pray and repent to God. <laughs> How you treated me today. I said, I will, I will, I'm so sorry what I did. She goes, no, you pray and repent to God what you did to me today, right? I failed, I did, I failed the pop quiz yesterday. The, challenge, the thing is that you will fail, but I woke up this morning and you know what I held on to? I held on to the promise that his mercies are new for me every morning. And I might have fell miserably yesterday, but I'm gonna get back up and I'm gonna do my best to pass it today pop quiz is that you experience it every day of your life. God will test you. He tests you because he loves you. He tests you because he wants to provide for you. But you got to pass the test. If you don't, the providentialness of God in your life will be something that you will not experience. A lot of you think his providence comes without you passing the test. It doesn't happen that way. You got to pass the test in order for God's providence to happen in your life, all right? The second thing we learn about heroic choices is that it's made when we obey God. Now let's get to the doing here. It's made when you and I obey God. The very last verse here in 22, verse 18 says, and through your offsprings, all nations on earth will be blessed because what? You have obeyed me. Our obedience to God leads to the heroic choices. If you want to make right choices, all you have to ask is, God, how can I obey you within this choice that you're asking me to make today? How can I obey you in the choice of do I get a divorce or do I actually work really hard on my marriage, right? 
My hope is that you would work really hard on your marriage. The easy way out is to get a divorce, right? Now, there's different circumstances for different people, all right? But for many of us, there usually we like to find the easy way out. But is, am I going to work hard for these choices? The choices, some of you might be engaged to get married to somebody. I'm not trying to break up your engagement. But you got to ask yourself, God, do you want me to marry this man or this woman? That's important. you got to stop making your own choices and try to live and know that God wants you to obey him. And so that's a critical choice that you have to make as well. Abraham obeyed God even though it didn't make sense. It was crazy. I mean, if I brought my son up here and I said, I'm going to sacrifice him today, I bet you all you guys would jump up on the stage and you would hold me down and call the cops. Right? It's crazy. That's how reckless he was in his obedience to him. Man, I pray for that. I really do. Remember what faith is. I told you what faith was about last week. It's about you knowing the promises that God has given to you and you living into those promises. You don't, those promises don't come alive in your life unless you're willing to live in it. I talked about obedience last week. I've been talking about it last couple of weeks. Josh preached on it two weeks ago as well. I know he, this Wednesday night service, he preached on obedience. There's a common theme here. Obedience, what you need to know as a Christian, it's not optional. It's a command. God commands you and I to be obedient to him. And you don't obey him so that you can be accepted by him. No, he's already accepted you through Jesus Christ. And so because he's accepted you, that's why you and I should obey him. Obedience is important. But many of you take that obedience and you really take it and hold it as a very low option in your life. And some of us, we pervert God's grace and say, I don't have to obey because at the end he will forgive me. I mean, God never wanted to give you his grace so you can pervert it and decide to disobey him. His grace was in hopes that you would learn to live a radically obedient life to him. You see, salvation is not from works. I talked about this last week, but it surely is for works. You will do good works if you say you're a follower of God. I love Abraham here because when he told Isaac, he says, Isaac said, Where, where's the lamb? And he said, don't worry, God will provide. That word provide in the Hebrew, it literally means to see, to see. When you and I obey God, get this, you will see God. When you and I obey God, you will see God. Now, how do we obey God? Well, we have a much higher advantage than Abraham did because we have the Bible. The Bible, in terms of how you are to live your life in every area, the Bible tells you how you and I are to live our lives. It's the perfect rule in how. So we have to devote ourselves to the scriptures and to learn, because as we learn the scriptures, God will speak to us in deep and powerful ways in how we are to live our lives. Many of us make choices that are contrary to the Bible, and then we pay the consequence for it. And many of you are doing that right now. But you got to know what the Bible says. you got to be a student of the word so that you can learn how God wants you to obey. So I want to encourage you to sign up for Pastor David Hosang's Summer UG on Philippians. It'll be uh, during, I think, the third service, right? 1245, I think, or something like that, to like 2 o'clock or 1.30 or something like that. But uh, I encourage you to take it because it's going to be an inductive study on the book of Philippians. But what he's going to do as you do this inductive study, he's going to teach you how you can study the word, how you can become a student of the word. And you guys don't know that David Hosan was a professor at New Testament at a couple seminaries around this country and also in Canada region. So he knows how to teach the Bible and how you can study it. I encourage you to do it. The other thing is you've got to also read it on your own. I encourage you to read like a, just a, a heading within a chapter. So like some chapters have four or five headings. There are, some of them are about eight to ten verses. Just read a heading, meditate on it, and ask two questions. God, what are you like in this passage? Journal about that. Second thing you ask yourself, how do you want me to obey you based upon this passage? That's a great question. What are you like? How would you like me to obey you now? Those, you ask those two questions when you read the Bible, it will come alive in you, right? So many of us, we complain, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. We always look at the other side, right? We look at other people's marriages, and maybe ours is lackluster, and so we say, wow, look at that wife. Like, she irons her man's clothes. 
she wakes up early in the morning and makes breakfast <laughs> for her man, right? We compare all the, we do that all the time. We compare, look at that guy's job or that girl's job, so amazing, and oh, look at this girl's life, look at who she's dating, Woo, man, it's amazing. We love to compare, and we always think the grass is greener on the other side. If you think the grass is greener on the other side, all you have to do is water your side. Amen. That's it. Just start watering your side and see the green pastures that were birthed out of you doing that. How do you water your side? Obedience. If you want to water your side, obedience. The reason why you're always looking at the other side is because you're not obeying God. And because you're not obeying God, you're not watering your side. So because your side is looking dead, you're always looking at the greener pastures elsewhere. But when you start to obey God, you start to see the greener pastures coming and you'll never compare. You'll be thankful for what God's given to you. Yeah, God may have blessed people more, given people more, but you'll be thankful for what he's given to you. The greatest barrier to your obedience is your desire to control your life. you got to surrender your control the way Abraham surrendered his control to God. Your desire to control your life is the greatest barrier for you to live a disobedient life and make terrible choices that often have severe, severe consequences in your life. And so obedience is essential in order for you to live a life of a hero. The third and last thing, heroic choices are made when you want capital O, capital N, capital L, capital Y, only God. Heroic choices are made when you want only God. Bucky says in the movie at the end, he says to Captain America, he goes, I don't know if I'm worth all of this. You're in such a mess because of me. And Captain America says, you're worth it all. You see, for Captain America, all he, what was enough for him was his relationship with Bucky being restored. He'd gladly go to jail for him for that. He'd gladly throw away his life so that that relationship could be restored. So much so that he ended up fighting to the death with Iron Man because of it. For Captain America, Bucky was enough. His relationship with Bucky was enough. I ask you, is your relationship with God enough for you? Abraham said yes. He gave up his son and said, God, you're enough for me. Is our faith focused on our hope and our expectations, or is it actually just focused on God? Here's the thing. Are you willing to follow God if there's nothing in it for you? Let me phrase it in another way. Will you follow God if you didn't go to heaven when you die? Would you? Would God be enough for you, or do you just follow him for the benefits package or for the feeling of peace and security that you have? If it was just God and God alone and nothing else, would you still follow him today? If he never blessed your marriage, if you never got married, right? If you never had what you really want, never had the house and the white picket fence and whatever, the job, if your marriage was never healed and it was horrible, would God still be enough for you? You see, heroic choices are made when you get to the place when you say, God, you're enough. I don't need anything else. You're enough. And it's hard. It's not easy to get to that place. But if you want to get to that place like Abraham, God has to be enough. He has to be your end, not a means to an end. My wife and I decided to do a vegan fast in May. And um, I've always wanted to do a real long-term fast, but um, I didn't think I could fast solid food for an entire month. And so I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do a vegan fast. I met up with one of my mentors in California, and he said, you know, that's a good kind of a way to fast. He fasted for 60 days, like doing like a vegan fast. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. And so I thought for me, I mean, food, if you talk about the foods that I love, it's, it's just really two things. I love anything that comes from animals and, 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 and seafood and, and sea creatures. All right, I love meat. I love cheese. love milk. I mean, I love all that stuff. So I said a vegan fast would be really hard for me just to eat stuff that, that's not from animal. 
And so my wife and I decided to do it for the month. And I got to tell you, it was hard, but there were moments where I felt like it wasn't that bad. Thanking God for that. I fell in love with a quinoa burger. I really did. And, uh, I, and just to let you know, even though my fast is over, this Friday I ate a quinoa. I decided not to eat a hamburger. I got a quinoa burger. That's how good it is. So, like, you learn new things. Uh, but the thing that was the hardest for me was that I, I gave up watching TV from Monday to Friday. That's hard for me because uh, I love watching sports and the NBA playoffs and the sports and different things. I love watching the news. I mean, that's just my thing. I mean, I worked in the industry, so I, I'm into that stuff. And so... Um, Giving that up was very difficult. And so uh, why did my wife and I do that? Why did my wife and I decide to, uh, to do that? Cause, was it because maybe we want to lose a little weight? No, that wasn't the reason why. The reason why is that I confess to you very honestly that I struggle with the whole reality that God's enough for me. I do struggle with it. And sometimes I feel like I, I, I can say he is. Cognitively, I know it, but I need to experience it for myself and get to those points while I'm struggling and I'm like, man, I gotta eat the salad thing again? <laughs> Remind myself again, this reminds me that God is enough. Amen. Amen. That I have to realize that I don't have to watch a Yankee game, I don't have to watch what's going on in the Western Conference Finals and Eastern Conference Finals, because at the end, God is enough for me. Amen. Would you give God a chance if there was nothing in it for you? Would you give God your life if, you, if he gave you nothing back but himself? Would you? My hope and my prayer for you is that all of you would be able to be like Abraham and you would be able to answer that with a resounding yes. The only choices, the, the most important thing that you have to take responsibility for is the choices that you can make today. Some of you are dying in your life because of the poor choices you're making. And my hope and my prayer today for you is that you would make the right choices, the heroic choices of obedience, the choice where you know that at the end, God is enough for you. And as you do, may you experience the splendor, wonder, glory of your God shining down on your life. Let's pray.